and incidentally, like that's not how the spiritual life works. It's like you can't like <laughs> I'm a level thirty four prayer <laughs> prayer master, so I can now levitate. You know, that's not how prayer works. You know, <laughs> let me turn my card. <laughs> I use the force, right? Welcome to another episode of The Table of Content. I am one of your hosts, Albert Sines, joined with the extremely intelligent, the dapper, Michael Steele. <laughs> Michael Steele, how are you? I'm here and, and really happy. Thank you, Albert. How, how are you doing? You know, uh, it's always good to be here. Let's put it that way. So I, I'm happy to be here so we can talk again uh, about another story. Yes. And uh, today we continue through stories from the Tall Tales Club. This is episode three, Gone Without a Trace, and basically a a magic show. A um, what's the other word for a magic show? A uh, what, what do they call magicians? They're a, a, an illusionist. Uh, an illusionist, right? right. Yes. I, I never watched a master of illusion. I never watched the movie. I've never actually really seen a real magician. I've seen like the clowns that know how to do things. Yeah, but I've right. never actually seen like a full magician show. Yeah, the um, sleight of hand. Right. And the, yes. Mirrors, smoke and mirrors. Yes, right. Uh, but no smoke and mirrors here. We this is this is a real conversation about a real story. Um, and uh, if you haven't listened to the story, we always like to remind you, you can go to our website, go to our Facebook page, go to YouTube, find us on our podcast, and you can listen uh, to Stories from the Tall Tales Club, That's right. episode three, Gone Without a Trace, and then you can come back to here. Yep. Spoilers ahead. Spoilers ahead. Thank you, Michael Steele. Uh, so we've got sort of... Uh, a magic show gone wrong. That's right. Yes. So we're, you know, the Tall Tale Club, they're sitting around and they're talking about another uh, experience, uh, this time from uh, Professor Moriarty. And Lady Jane kind of pokes fun at him because Sherlock Holmes' arch nemesis was Professor Moriarty, right? right a brilliant right. evil mastermind. And and Moriarty, in an exasperated way, said, no, it's doctor, but I'm a <laughs> physicist. I've got PhDs in physics and engineering, and I prefer the title of doctor. So he's not just kind of your like carnival sideshow hustler. He does have some um, legitimate education. You know, I... Uh... I like I like the story mm. because again another sort of sense of adventure and mystery right and and Joe and Joe Potts the the writer uh, is always very good at sort of intermingling the two right so you're like oh like there's uh, there's there's a this, ma this magician or this illusionist, there's there's guns, you know. Yes, and I, right. I, I don't want to make it sound like, like there's a gunfight. It's just you, you get these <laughs> elements introduced yes. into a story and suddenly you're sort of like, well, what's going on? You know, and then, of course, the the mishap goes on, which is basically that the, the guns disappear, but they like really disappear. Right. And Lexi Larson, the... the the, the southern twanged sharpshooter mm -hmm. uh, wants to know what happened to her guns mm -hmm. or to her gun. And uh, they end up appearing later. Yes. So it's like, oh my gosh, like they right. disappeared, they reappeared. Right. So it's, it's sort of a fun story. So you're yeah. dealing kind of with multiple elements here. But again, that's, that's one of Joe's strong points. Right. And just how his stories are interwoven with all these uh, tall tale characters that we love. You know, uh, Lexi Larson is kind of styled after Annie Oakley, right? And you think of Professor Moriarty as you're, you're drawn into the world of Sherlock Holmes. And then it's set in the whole world of carnival, you know, like the, the, the whole kind of mysterious kind of entertainment, at times a little bit creepy kind of world of carnival, right? And right. so there is that sense of mystery, that sense of adventure. And then the whole deeper element of, uh, you know, physics and maybe even quantum physics. And can we like beam things from, from one place to another place? We talked about being here, right? You know, like beam me up, Scotty. Right, right, but, right, uh, right, yeah. 
So, you know, this intermingling of science and sort of science and fiction, not to be confused with science fiction, but, mm -hmm. you know, in, in our world, right, we, we look for, we look for entertainment. We look for, you know, escape from reality. Yes. Yeah. And you know, stories in of themselves are, are, are good escapes and Joe helps us there. But the story sort of helps sort of to highlight us as humans, right? We, we go looking for something to get us away from, from reality. Right. So like, okay, the carnival is an escape. A, magi a, a magician is, is a real escape. We're like, that's not possible, right? So our brains are turned on when we see something disappear. We're like, what happened? Where did it go, right? And then it appears and it's that awe, you know, and, and we sort of, we, we seek that out, I think, intentionally, unintentionally. Right. Because it's, it's a chance to not have to sort of be in the world to, that, that we know. Right. There's that sense of mystery that there's something beyond our normal experience that is somehow uh, beckoning to us. It intrigues us. And then especially with magicians or, or illusionists, right, they seem to be able to suspend the natural laws of reality or the natural laws of physics and there's something in there. We have our, this, our own personal experience about how things ought to be. You know, if I drop this pen, it should, you know, it falls, right? But then if someone, you know, has a pen and then all of a sudden it's no longer there through a sleight of hand, right? It's, uh, it makes us wonder. Or if it doesn't fall. Or if it does, yeah, if I, yeah, or if it just floats, right? Um, there's something there that, that grabs our interest, our curiosity. It's like, huh, that is outside of the ordinary, uh, outside of the ordinary. Yeah. So we, so what happens, right? As we said, it, it was, it was a, it was a, a magic show that sort of went, went awry because Moriarty has said he built this device, which mm. was supposed to be for Watkins, right. who wanted to basically make this transporting uh, illusion. It yeah. was going to take Lexi's gun and take it to the other side of the stage. Pearl handed. Pearl, or per, pearl, pearl, pearl handled. Very, yeah. Right. Le <laughs> Lexi's very good. Say like, this is a very special gun. Yes. Uh, so, and as, as in, as again, as we noted, the, the sleight of hand, the smoke of mirrors, it was supposed to be pulled out from a box underneath and put into the other box. And that was supposed to be the end of it. Yeah. Right. But what happened is the gun actually disappears. Yes. So the gun disappears. And what happens from that point is it kind of the show, right? It, it wrecks the show because everyone's sort of laughing mm -hmm. and they think it didn't work. And Moriarty feels the weight. Yeah. The weight of what he feels is a failure. The weight of what he feels is disappointment. The weight of the the stain on his career because he has yeah. a distinguished career. Right. And so he feels all of this sort of weight that apparently no one else felt, but for him it was his device. Yes. It was his it was his name that was sort of taking a chance here. Right. And this failure yes. ends up coming back to really hurt him. Yes. And so we talk about um, that want to, that desire to believe, right? But then you have that dramatic tension of the showman who knows all the inner workings as well as the audience as the outside observer. And you so you have kind of Watkins and Moriarty and Lexi all in on the act. Like this is how things are supposed to work out in order to produce this perceived experience of wonder for the audience. But we all know it's smoke and mirrors, right? But then things don't go as they planned, and that's an emotionally shattering event for uh, Moriarty himself. You know, and I, and it's it's a it's a small observance of you. You make a really interesting point uh, talking about the expectations that Watkins, Moriarty, and Lexi sort of have going into the show, and going back to our first sort of major point of discussion coming to the carnival, coming to the magician show mm. to sort of have that escape, to look for the something that's beyond, to right. sort of get out of the world that we know, to sort of live in awe for, for a moment. But then we sort of come back down and, okay, that was fun. Yeah. 
in this instance, right, the expectation is that the gun is going to go into a box that's flashing and making sounds, and then it's supposed to sort of be taken to the other side and doesn't go that way. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a silver lining uh, to this whole story, and we'll get there. But yes. the the concept is that what I thought of is that that's sort of a sort of life. We we go and we say, "All right, I'm going to do this thing, and it's going to have this outcome." Right. And you know, God is being God. It's like, all right, this is this is what's going to happen. And God's like, that's great. No, that's not what's going to happen. <laughs> and it's not what we expected, you yeah. know. And yeah. and and we're going to get to the. We're, I'm going to come back to this point also because I want to keep working to the story. But it's interesting because a lot of times you're like, ah, I didn't go the way that I thought. And right. in this instance, right, Moriarty, as I said, is feeling all of the shame from something that went wrong. And he was like, this is his teleportation device. Look at it fail. Yes. Right? So, and, and that's, that's how it is with sometimes with our life and with God, we're like, ah, this, this went terrible and it's not immediate, but God is working through that moment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We have this expectations of how things ought to be right on the one hand, and that points to our subjectivity as human beings. But then there's reality on the other side. And then there's also the reality of God who is working as well, who's kind of working all things towards the good, his good, his plan, right? And that as well is another mystery of our life, our dynamic with, uh, with the divine, if you will, right? The fact that he's created us free to do, uh, to use our freedom for loving him and doing the good. And we try as much as possible and we fail sometimes, but in all of that, he's still working out his plan, his providential plan somehow mysteriously. And as you were talking, I was thinking that's really the classic definition of a miracle, right? That God's direct intervention or a suspension of a natural law and and saying like, wait a minute, I'm the, I'm, I made everything here. So, uh, we're going to like suspend the law of gravity for a moment. And we're going to have this person levitate as they pray or whatever, you know, whatever the miracle happens to be. So uh, that was interesting that you mentioned that. Who's the flying saint? Uh, saint, uh, I think, oh, it's, um, there's a town in, Calif Cupertino, right? Right, right. Yes. Joseph Cupertino? Yes, Joseph Cupertino. Right. Um, but then I also recently found out that there are other saints who have also levitated in prayer as well. There was one recently that we celebrated. And of course, with my short-term memory, like I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> right, right. But yeah. Well, uh, be sure you let us know when you're levitating right. in prayer. Yeah, exactly. Right. So we can know that, ah, oh, God has suspended the law of gravity <laughs> for Michael Steele. Right. Yeah. And incidentally, like, that's not how the spiritual life works. It's like, you can't like, <laughs> I'm a level 34 prayer, <laughs> prayer master, so I can now levitate. You know, that's not how prayer works, you know. <laughs> let me turn my card. <laughs> I use the force, right? <laughs> Anyways, it's, yeah, that's God's work through that person. Right, right, exactly, right. Um, so the next stage is we're we're in Moriarty's apartment, and Watkins comes to visit, and Moriarty is just completely just beside himself. Yeah, he he is he is feeling all of of despair, shame, embarrassment, pain. You know what is everything now that he had this appointment, and Watkins is like trying to talk to me is like, you don't understand. It, it's, it's, it's over. Like, this is terrible. And it's like, no, no, you, you, you don't get at it. And it, it has the elements of like Job in it, right? Yes. Like Job sort of going on about uh, all these terrible things and, you know, right. and, and the, his friends who, who are, you know, good intentioned, right. Are trying to sort of help him. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but, Oh, just life is terrible, you know? So he's got that sort of Job-esque thing going on right now. Right. But Watkins keeps pressing him and says, you don't understand. Like, 
yeah. the gun is like I found the gun. Like the gun appeared next to some people elsewhere in the carnival. Right. It's like your machine worked. Right. And and Watkins just is like, what are you talking about? Yes. Right. And there's that saying like the every artist is their worst their own worst critic or something like that, right? That idea of he Moriarty knew and had put his own creative effort and work into making this thing. And he had all the science and education. And uh, and so he was more involved than anyone else, right? Everyone else was just sort of an outside observer, right? So of course he would feel that tremendous crush of it not working, you know, or not going as the way it was supposed to. And, uh, and I feel as well that Watkins shows himself a good friend in this moment where he goes to Moriarty and encourages him and, and, and wants to help him, sees that he's suffering and wants to lift him up. Yeah. Right. So. But this is also the point where we, re where we realize, right, because Watkins is explaining that it actually worked, where is your machine, right? And, right. and but this is where I, what I was getting to before, this is the silver lining and this is the unexpected Right. This is the, the 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 suspension of the of what was supposed to happen. Like, well, right. Because it was supposed to be a box of flashing lights and sounds. Right. Right. Which is a re a realistic thing. Yes. Right. Anything outside of that is outside of the law of the this really non functioning light box. Right. Right. So right. Right. Yes. What happens is now. Moriarty is faced with the reality of, wait a second, my expectations were that right. this box was going to make some sounds and flash some lights. Someone was going to reach under, take the gun, put it in the other flashing box, and that was going to be the end of it. Yes. You know, so and much like I said, God comes in and says, that's not how it's going to happen. This is how it's going to happen. And guess what? What yeah. ends up happening is a lot better than your expectations. Right. So, yes. so Moriarty is having trouble grappling with with what actually happened because it was outside of what he had anticipated. Right. So when a miracle happens, yes. a saint levitates, there right. is a healing, yes. there's some other miracle. Yeah. We're like, that's not what I expected. Right. So our brains are just like, oh yes. my gosh, right. something fantastical, right. something mir God is at work. Right. There's right? a higher power here. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I, I hadn't thought about that. So. He had made the box, and that was all it was supposed to be, a box of flashing lights to, as a stage prop for this skit that they were doing, an illusion, right? But the fact that it actually turned out to be an authentic, uh, bona fide working teleportation device was something amazing, right? Yeah, and and that's that's like the silver lining that you talk about. That's the aha moment. Like it actually worked. The reason why the the pearl handled pistol was missing was because it was actually teleported to another part of the carnival. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And and there is there is part of the the life of faith. Mm -hmm. You know. We, we want one thing, we expect one thing, and God has something better for us. Yeah, right. And, and that's much of our life, right? Yeah. In, 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 our, in our efforts to, to seek out God's will, right. God says, that's great, and I will bless you for that. Mm -hmm. But I do have something different planned for you. Whether it's easy or hard or involves some suffering, God's got his plan, right? God's yes. plan. And I know it's overused, but people say, you want to make God laugh, you know, tell him your plans, right? Yes. Right. But that's what happens, right? We go out there, we live our life, say, all right, God, I'm doing my best. Right. This is what I'm going to do. God says, that's great. I love you. We're going to do something different. Yeah. And we're going we're gonna to make this thing work differently than you're trying to build it. Right. I'm going to make your life work a little bit differently than you are trying to build it out to be. Yeah. But I promise you that in the end, it's going to be to your greater glory. Right. And you're going to come to know that I was involved yes. and that I was taking care of you. Right. So Moriarty has this box, which unfortunately he has destroyed. You hear in the story, he just completely dismantled it. Hmm. But he knows now, he knows that 
this teleportation is possible. Now yes. he knows that what he did without even trying or thinking, he was able to accomplish something great. Right. Yeah. To your previous point, Albert, I was just thinking what a beautiful prayer it would be to just say, God, please broaden or please raise my expectations, right? Because that's really what's happening here, right? Moriarty has very low expectations, you know, let's just do a stage prop and then something entirely uh, qualitatively, quantitatively superior happens. And that's, I think, what you were kind of alluding to is like many times I feel like speaking from personal experience, my expectations from life are so low like you were saying, and God is like, your expectations are down here. My expectations are up here. And by the way, I have all the wherewithal to bring you to this, right? If you just kind of lift up your gaze, right? open up. Right. Instead of looking down, yes. look up. Right. Look up. Or instead of destroying the stage prop, you know? And I feel like that's also the dramatic kind of crush of this story is the fact that in his moment of like failure, he destroys the the uh, teleportation box. You know, I, I like I like at the end, right? Because now he's sort of you know, Watkins sort of really was sort of trying to say like, "This is great, you can do this." Yeah. You know, and right. so he is. He's being a good friend. But you, but you come back to to the club here in the ending scene, and mm. Moriarty has this this place where he says, yes, I threw myself into my work, despite some lingering doubts that haunted me from time to time. Thank heaven, my friend Willie was always there for me, mm -hmm. like an angel sent from heaven to reassure and encourage me. <laughs> and Pascal says, yes, Saint Willie the Conjurer, muse to the stars, please spare us. <laughs> <laughs> so I love the, yeah, it, the snarky remarks. Of, yeah, yeah. It wouldn't be a Tall Tales Club without some snarkiness. That's right. Uh, so he and ends up that he he was able to sort of uh, along the way in the midst of trying to recreate the teleporter, like make some other really big discoveries, which are very good. And that 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 concept, though, going back, this is that 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 his friend Willie was being was like an angel sent from heaven. And we go back right. to that point of God intervenes, God supports us, God carries us, God takes us through the unexpected. Right. We land on our feet and we start moving. It's like, this isn't where I thought I was going to be. Right. But then we also have that opportunity to potentially do something that we didn't think we were going to do, right? So, yes. so Moriarty, I developed the equations that led to a new energy source. The quantum battery I developed revolutionized the electric car industry. You know, it also put uh, put feathers in the caps of myself and the university, as well as putting a few dollars in my pocket. Right. You know, but the biggest boost was the boost to his confidence. Yes. So right. from what was supposed to be yeah, just the thing, right? And what if the show had worked the way it was supposed to? What if the lights had flashed? Right. Someone was able to reach up and grab the gun, go take it over, put it in the box, the show was over, people clapped, kids were like, mommy, daddy, that's great. If everything had went according to plan. Right. They would have been content with they that. They would have been content with life. Yeah. Moriarty would have gone about him and done his normal PhD level things. Right. Watkins would have continued to be an entertainer. Lexi would have gotten her gun back and continue to go shoot up the world. Yeah. But this wouldn't have happened. Right. Right. This chance for Watkins to come in and say, you've got to do this, this, this push to boost his confidence, to support him, to make these other discoveries. Yes. All because the show didn't go the way they expected. Right. So the expectations of that particular incident were not met and something greater happened. Yeah. Right. So while yes, you're right that in our own personal lives, if we would set our expectations that God can do something great out of this. Yes. Whatever it is that's going to happen, God's going to do something great out of this. If we could look at it that way and those yeah. expectations, those are good. But sometimes our unmet expectations will have equally or greater outcomes. And sometimes even our outright failures as well. Right. If, and, I, and maybe that's another lesson to be learned here as well, that when we fail, look for the lessons to be learned and don't give in to discouragement, but see that as an opportunity for growth and, and persevere. Right. And sometimes we do need the encouragement of friends like sure. uh, Watkins and Willie to help us 
through those tough moments. Right. But yeah. Right. Yeah. Great. Excellent. Well, as usual, and we've said it multiple times in the last several episodes, Joe Potts gives us another really good story. Yes. You know, thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you, Joe, once again. Um, so this is Stories from the Tall Tales Club, episode two, Gone Without a Trace. Gone Without a Trace. So I encourage you to go listen to the story. I encourage you to uh, listen to other stories from the Tall Tales Club. Listen to a lot of the stories that we have on Audio Theater. Uh, and if you like us... You can hit like and subscribe. There, I said it right this time. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, uh, we, we would love to have you on board because we're going to keep going and we're going to keep making content on the table of content. And then we're also just going to continue in audio theater. So if you're liking We're One Body Audio Theater, we'd love to have you as a subscriber. So, yes. Michael Steele, thanks again for another excellent episode. Thank you, Albert. Yes. And, and thank you for joining us here at the Table of Content. Until the next episode, ladies and gentlemen, be good, stay safe, peace. <laughs>